Be Inventive Podcast. Mixing engineering fact and fiction. Inventive. 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 With Trevor Cox, Professor of Acoustic Engineering at the University of Salford. Today we're soaring into the skies before splashing down back to Earth. Because my guest on this episode of Inventive is an aerospace engineer who's also a self-confessed mermaid. She's Sophie Robinson. And to mix our engineering fact and fiction, we've turned to author Tony White. He's written a wonderful tale that mixes Sophie's interest in wild swimming, her job as an aircraft engineer, and our discussions about the ethics of engineering. I was never actually in the military. I worked for a company that worked with the military a lot. They heard the helicopter before they saw it. Fee felt like the last time she was here, it had been her that needed rescuing. So, yeah, just massive conflict of interest all the time. (laughs) Inventive. 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 We've also got Sophie lined up to listen to Tony's story. This, this is a little nerve-wracking for me because you don't know quite how an engineer is going to react. I hope she likes it. But before we do that, it's time to chat to Sophie. Hi there, Sophie. Welcome to Inventive. Hello. Tell us about yourself. Uh, My name is Sophie Robinson and I am the Senior Flight Dynamics Engineer at Vertical Aerospace, who are a company based in Bristol who are building uh, an electrical vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, commonly referred to as an air taxi. I feel very at home. I'm a Bristolian. You probably won't recognise the accent, but I was born and bred Bristol. So... I mean, I've seen you described as an aerospace engineer. I mean, if you had to describe that to sort of friends and family outside the field, how would you describe what you do? So as an aerospace engineer, you are involved in the whole life cycle of anything that flies. So the design, so right from the beginning, all the way through to the certification, to the actual operation, the maintenance and even kind of what happens to aircraft after you finish using them. So you, how they are disposed of, how they are disposed of safely. So yeah, the whole life cycle of aircraft, basically, of many different types. Um, in my job specifically, I've done a lot of different things um, in various different bits of the kind of aerospace engineering world. But at the moment, I am uh, responsible for the delivery of the simulator that we will use to train our pilots and uh, investigate kind of how the aircraft that we've designed will fly. So that's part of my job. I'm also involved in the delivery of the control laws for the aircraft. So the brain of the aircraft. So how the pilot's commands are translated from the sticks into the actual aircraft motion and also kind of the performance calculations. So how the aircraft performs basically. Uh, yeah, and this this vertical takeoff vehicle you're making. I mean, I, I guess m- many people will have seen a pictures of tiny little drones. You know, little mm-hmm. quadcopter drones. Describe to me what your prototype aircraft looks like. Then, so if you imagine a traditional aeroplane with the wings sticking out, um, on the wings of this aircraft, we've got eight rotors, four on the leading edge, so on the front and four on the trailing edge of the wing at the back. The ones on the front are able to tilt. So they'll go from a vertical position and they travel through 90 degrees into a forward pointing position, which allows the aircraft to be able to take off vertically when they're pointing upwards or conventionally when they're pointing forwards. And then we can cruise like a normal fixed wing aircraft. In terms of size of the aircraft itself, It's able to take four passengers and their luggage and the pilot sat in the front. And it's got a an overall wingspan of about 15 meters. So, you know, it's not small, but it's not enormous either in terms of the scale. That really paints a lovely picture. I mean, you talk about taking people and maybe taxiing around. Is that what we're we're using it for as a taxi? And and, 
I mean, why do we need to have these electrical vehicles in the air? Yeah, so the, the intention is that this aircraft will kind of fill that taxi role. So actually one of the, the missions that we've been flying in our simulator is, for example, taking off from London City Airport and taxiing in the air <laughs> down the River Thames and landing at the heliport in Battersea. So in our aircraft, that journey will take you seven minutes. In the tube, it's a lot longer than seven minutes. And in a taxi on the road, it's probably even longer. On a bus, even longer. So it's really intended to be used for those sort of medium range journeys. And you could also use it intercity. So if you are flying from Heathrow to Brighton or you were flying from Heathrow to Bristol, you could use it for that. And the idea behind it is purely to ease congestion on the roads and also to reduce carbon emissions because it's zero emissions at the point of use. So, yeah, that's the typical use case for it initially. And then obviously, as battery technology improves, we'll be able to increase the range. So these might be able to fly further and fly with greater endurance, so fly for longer. But initially, it's those kind of short hops that they'll be used for. One thing that strikes me about these kind of technologies is we have terribly clogged up roads. So we've kind of filled the ground space up in, in, in cities and concreted them over. And so the idea is obviously get in the sky, you can avoid this congestion, but did. But it kind of, you know, I suppose the, the question is, what are the problems with going up into the air with lots of people travelling? I think there are three, actually three main kind of challenges with integrating this type of aircraft into the airspace. So whilst you might look up and the sky seems to be pretty empty, actually in terms of air traffic control, it's insanely busy up there. So there isn't much space for them already. So how we integrate this type of aircraft into our current air traffic setup is going to be a really interesting question. Another of the primary concerns obviously of people who live in the areas that these kind of aircraft would operate in because another potential use for them would be to hop from the suburbs into the inner city. If you live in the suburbs, you live there because you quite like it because it's nice and quiet. And what you don't want is enormous electrical air taxi vehicle coming and landing on, say, the top of the apartment building where you live. So we're actively designing this aircraft to be incredibly quiet it's actually 30 times quieter than a helicopter. In order to achieve that, we're using distributed proportion. So I was talking before about the wing having eight rotors on it. So the proportion is distributed between these eight rotors. That means that we can have significantly lower tip speeds on the rotors. So the speed at which the rotor blades are turning is a lot lower compared to the same helicopter. Because I don't know if you've ever been in the back of a helicopter, but it's quite nasty back there it can be very loud it can be very high vibration it can be very hot so the passenger experience and also the experience of the people that are going to have to accept this type of vehicle operating in the areas where they live is very high on our mind and that means it can blend into the background almost of city life well, you've, I mean, you've, I'm an acoustic engineer, so I know you've got some fundamentals to fight there in the physics, but I think it's it's very yeah, good gonna... that you're, you're thinking of that at, at the outset, and, really. Yeah, and it's one of the primary things. But the third point is that this has to be something which everybody can afford to use. So the the goal is that a trip in one of our electric aircraft would cost you about the same as it would cost you getting a taxi. It's all about gaining acceptance from the public. And as you mentioned there, if your neighbour keeps using these vehicles but you don't like them, you're much more likely to be annoyed by them. Exactly, exactly. And almost, you know, that's that's the key piece that we really have to solve because all of the technologies to make this type of vehicle happen exist. Like, we're not conjuring things out of thin air that don't, exist at the moment it's all about bringing those technologies together into a package to make it happen but then once it's there if nobody wants to use it then what's the point so we really have to make sure that these are going to be accepted by people and they are socially acceptable as well and also you know just from a personal point of view i 
don't want to work on creating something that everybody hates. <laughs> um, that's, you know, that's not a good thing for your career, is it? <laughs> well, speaking of your career, in the past, you've been employed by someone who works for the military. Uh, so just to be 100% clear, I was never actually in the military. I worked for a company that worked with the military a lot. So, yeah, just massive conflict of interest all the time. <laughs> oh, I understand. Uh, thinking about the military makes me think about a description I've heard about engineering. Uh, someone mm. once said that engineering is really about weapons, tools or toys. So I guess the military is about weapons. Yeah. But what about your electronic vehicles, your electronic aircraft? I mean, are they really a tool or are they just a toy? If I genuinely thought that these vehicles were just going to be toys for rich people, I wouldn't want to be involved in it, quite frankly. So they will be tools, but if it becomes uh, increasingly likely that they're going to be toys, then I will maybe be thinking about moving on. <laughs> well, I guess certainly, you know, these devices could be vital tools. I, I'm thinking there of things like disaster relief, where yeah. you could fly things into places which would be difficult to get to. I mean, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how you might use these electronic aircraft for disaster relief. There's been quite a few examples in recent times of unmanned air systems being involved in disaster relief so eventually the aircraft that we're designing will be able to be autonomous so it will be operated without a pilot on board now that opens up a whole area of use for this aircraft for example if there's been say a flood or there's been an earthquake and the infrastructure in the local area has been damaged you can use these kind of vehicles for transporting supplies and so essential supplies to people who would otherwise be cut off and this actually is already happening in a lot of places on a smaller scale so there are projects in parts of africa which are using smaller drones to deliver essential medicines and even organs for transplant are packed and put onto these drones and then flown from hospital to hospital so, yeah, there's potential there that they could be used for this kind of thing. So basically, as long as you've got a flat enough area that's large enough to accommodate a vehicle like this that it can land on, it could be used for that. So, I mean, interesting enough, you have a tattoo which says nothing great is easy. I do. Can you tell me where that comes from? So nothing great is easy is a quote from Captain Webb, who was the first person to swim the English Channel. And I swam the channel in 2012. I am a mermaid when I'm not an engineer. <laughs> uh, I'm and really yeah, impressed. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think I would be able to do it now. It's been it's been a fair few number of years, but uh, yeah. So I think nothing great is easy. Rings true in a lot of areas of life, and certainly in what we're trying to achieve. When we achieve it, and I say when because we absolutely will. When we get to the point of doing the first flight of the aircraft that we're developing, it will be a great achievement and it won't have been easy, but we will get there. And you have to remember that as we're going through this incredibly difficult journey and breaking all this new ground, it's going to be worth it in the end. It will be something that in my career, I might never get to do again, you know, be involved in the first flight of a completely novel aircraft type, th that opportunity doesn't come along every day. So, yeah, it's kind of just something that I used to motivate myself <laughs> when things get a little bit difficult and we get a bit bogged down. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a most uh, audacious kind of piece of engineering, <laughs> but I wonder if you thought of other engineering, what's, what, what do you think is the most audacious act of engineering oh, neck. that's ever been? That's a good question. The most audacious act of engineering... I guess I guess it it must have to be the early Soviet cosmonauts because they were strapping themselves to rockets that are going into space as part of like the space race with the United States and they got computers then which were less powerful than the mobile phone that sits in your pocket now everything was calculated and done by hand 
yeah, definitely that. <laughs> I, I guess being an aerospace engineer, you could you could go into space engineering if you wanted. I would love to. It's on the career to do list. So yeah, Jeff Bezos, give me a call. I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> and, and does that actually include? Getting in the aircraft, a bit like your cold water swimming, you know, feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Exactly. Amongst all of the other strange things I wanted to be as a kid, I definitely wanted to be an astronaut. I think I might be a bit old now, though. Well, they did, didn't did they put someone really quite old into space? The Americans, didn't they? A senator or something who was 70s or oh, really? something? Yeah. Never too late. Okay. Ma- yeah, it's never too late. All right. I'll, be- I'll bear that in mind for my retirement <laughs> instead. <laughs> I mean, does engineering come naturally to you? That's a very good question. So I think engineering is a hybrid of skills. So when I was younger, I was always really into uh, maths and science when I was at school. Uh, I, I would have gone to university, probably done a pure maths degree. But there was something always nagging in the back of my mind that I would have to get a job after I left university and it maybe wasn't as clear to me about what I would do with a pure maths degree afterwards. I also always wanted to do something that was kind of more practical and creative. So I enjoyed art. I used to really enjoy building things. I was big into Meccano when I was a kid, big into Lego, all of those things. And I think as a kid, I ended up with like an equivalent amount of Lego to my body weight <laughs> during most of my childhood. You, you, you didn't have engineers in your family, did you? Uh, no, my dad. So my dad um, used to work down the pit. That's a very good northern working class career. He was always, you know, he used maths in his job. But no, nobody in my family directly was an engineer. But I was always really lucky in that my parents encouraged me in whatever I expressed interest in so if they bought me some Lego and I liked it they would buy me more Lego they always encouraged me obviously with like my academic work and you know the maths and the sciences the fundamentals of becoming a good engineer you know having a good grasp of those basic things but I think I had the extra thing which was that I wanted to make things which is what engineers do So, yeah, whilst I didn't have directly somebody to follow to be an engineer, I always was encouraged in a way which it kind of ended up being inevitable. (laughs) So so your parents were very supportive of you getting into university and, and pursuing your engineering career? Yeah, absolutely. And both my parents actually went to university later in life. I would have been like 10 or 11, maybe. So, yeah, my mum was a hairdresser originally and trained to be a nurse as an adult and as all of the the mines in the area started to close and my dad he trained to become a design and technology teacher so really they obviously wanted me to do well in life and at the time the way that you did that was by getting good grades at school going to university and then you get a professional job so they were they were always very encouraging of me engineering seemed to be a good way to apply my skills that would have the real potential to change things and make a difference uh, and also I would have been useless if I'd have had to get a, a, any other job really I can't imagine doing anything else um, if I'd have had to become a hairdresser there'd be lots of people walking about with terrible haircuts <laughs> or something like that you know <laughs> Now we've got a sense of Sophie, her backstory in engineering, it's time to see what that inspires in a writer of fiction. Inventive. We've commissioned a piece from the novelist Tony White, who includes on his CV being writer in residence at the London Science Museum. Now he's come back with a great short story inspired by Sophie's interview, it's called The Hot Wells Cold Water Swimming Club. Not only that, but I've invited Sophie back to see what she makes of it. Welcome back, Sophie. I believe you've been in touch with the author Tony White in between times. 
Yes, I have. We've done, uh, well, we've had a lot of uh, very interesting chats, actually. Yeah, it's fascinating because I've never worked with a, a, a fiction author. What, what is this clarifying bits about you or what, what your engineering's about or what was he, what was he interested in? <laughs> so we talked about a lot of things, actually. So, yeah, we did, we did talk a little bit about um, kind of my background and we talked about helicopters for a while. But we, uh, we also spent quite a while talking about swimming. Uh, and I think uh, Tony was trying to get to the bottom of why swimming in such cold water appeals to me <laughs> and checking that I was like mentally OK. <laughs> yeah, I've got friends who cold water swim and I, uh, yes, I, I find the appeal hard to understand. But there we go. Uh, <laughs> each to their own. I'm glad you like it. Uh, do you have an idea what's yeah. in the story then? I don't. He was very, uh, Tony kept it very close to his chest. So it would be a surprise for me today. Ah, oh, that's really interesting because we didn't we didn't know until chatting to you what, what you knew or didn't know. I mean, what's interesting is Tony has picked up on a passing comment about conflict of interest that you said in the original interview, Ooh. and he's really expanded on it. But uh, I won't give you any spoilers. Look, maybe we'll ask the producer Adam to play the story, and then we'll come back to you and see what you thought. Okay, great. The Hot Wells Cold Water Swimming Club by Tony White. What? You swam the channel? said Suzanne, clearly impressed. Seriously? Blimey, you kept that quiet. When was this? Oh, ages ago, said Fee, when I was doing my PhD. That's when I got the tattoo. What's it say again? said Suzanne. Nothing great is easy, said Fee. It's a quote from Captain Webb, you know, the first person to... Swim the English Channel, said Suzanne. Yeah, I saw it on TV. They were driving to Snowdonia, and to pass the time, Fee and Suzanne were having one of those how-did-he-get-into-all-this conversations. It was mainly work chat, but wide-ranging enough to include Fee's channel swim... (laughs) and whether they'd been the first in their respective families to go to university. Suzanne was. Fee wasn't, though her parents had only just beaten her to it, doing their degrees when Fee had been 11 or 12. This latest outing of the self-styled Hot Wells Cold Water Swimming Club was very different to Fee's last visit to Hlinidwal, five years before. For a start... That time she'd been on her own. And yes, if anyone asked, the correct answer would be that with cold water swimming, you should always swim with somebody else, especially if you're a beginner. But Fee was experienced enough to go on her own sometimes. A, because she enjoyed it. And B, she'd been doing it for 10 years, so knew her limits. Knew how to read the signs that she needed to get out. The Hot Wells Cold Water Swimming Club wasn't really a club at all, but Peter had designed a logo and ordered them a t-shirt each from one of his merch suppliers. Fee and Suzanne were in Suzanne's Audi. Both women worked in aviation, which was not uncommon in Bristol. Less common to be a woman in a field largely dominated by straight white men. The rest of the gang, Leah, Peter and Richard, were following in Peter and Richard's Range Rover. Fee had met them all just five years earlier, shortly after moving to Bristol, at a protest against untreated sewage being discharged into the Avon from outflows upstream near Bath. They'd all got on, so went for late lunch afterwards at the pump house, round the corner from Suzanne's place in Hotwell's, exchanging wild swimming war stories over the scallops and salt marsh lamb. She'd told her new friends about going to St Petersburg, where every winter a swimming pool was cut into the ice in the centre of a great frozen lake. After that, they'd all gone swimming together, more or less monthly. Then, once a year, just before Easter... They'd go farther afield, maybe to Dartmoor, or the Western Isles, with their glorious white sandy beaches. This time, 
it was Fee's turn to choose. So they were going to her favourite place. Chlyn Idwal, in Snowdonia National Park. It was the kind of photogenic landscape that could be a screensaver on your laptop or TV. A placid lake in its own glacially sculpted hanging valley, surrounded on three sides by a rocky, horseshoe-shaped ridge of bare mountains. On a good day, the lake was a mirror, reflecting the jagged skyline. On a bad day, you couldn't even see the other side. They'd committed to an early start, and with luck, they'd be up at the lake and setting up a bivvy by early afternoon. Suzanne was fascinated by the idea of the EV toll aircraft Fee was working on, effectively a low or no carbon emission flying taxi, but she also found it challenging. Fee didn't mind talking about work or being asked tough questions. With all the specialist jargon, open coaxial lifting rotors, watt hour per kilo ratios, wind tunnel test campaigns, it was refreshing to talk to someone with whom you could assume some aeronautical knowledge. When your job involved designing new processes, tools and capabilities, it was useful to talk things through. Both women knew that in aeronautical engineering, how clearly and precisely you could describe something and be understood, could make the difference between life and death. Fee, do you mind me asking why you left your last job? At Force 4. How long have you got? Said Fee, only half joking. No rush, said Suzanne. I'm not going anywhere. Fee didn't want to get into all that right now. Her former job at Force 4 had dominated the last trip to Hlinidwal five years before, so she was damned if it would dominate this one. Maybe later, she said, then pointed at the horizon. Look! Mountains! It was a half-hour walk from the visitor centre car park, but the weather was good. Fee had shared the MWIS forecast on WhatsApp the day before, so everyone would know what to expect. Little or no rain, inland valleys freezing at dawn, low-level fog clearing through the morning, sunshine breaking through, high of 6 degrees, local 40 mile per hour gusts on the high tops, no wind chill below 900 metres. As good as it got, basically. Although, this being Wales, things were forecast to get colder, wetter and windier over the next two days. Swimming outside in the winter... The water always was freezing. When it's that cold, there's a range of physiological changes that happen in your body. You get an immediate fight-or-flight response. And there's nothing like being in a genuine survival situation to empty your mind of everything else. When you're surrounded by constant noise... A chance to focus on how you feel in your body is important, being wholly present. And if, like Fee, you are one of those people whose brain never switches off, the focus and stillness was great for reminding you what really mattered. Plus cake and six pints of hot chocolate afterwards, of course. And you really did need to be careful to get out and get warm because if you weren't careful, you could die. If there were currents, waves or open water like today, then one of you swam and the other buddied, and the next day vice versa. So with the five of them, three would swim and two would buddy. And even once you've got out, you carry on getting colder, so you've got a very short time to get dressed and to re-warm. The ones not swimming can help. For Fee, the warning signs showed in the extremities, hands, feet, face. You should be able to tap your thumbs and fingers together. If you're cold, you start getting the claw and can't do it accurately. Even cold feet were dangerous because you had to be able to walk to get out. Some people got the shakes or, paradoxically, found their skin felt incredibly hot. 
People often became giggly and delirious when they got too cold. Fee thought about the last time she'd come. The sound of her own boots crunching through a light covering of snow. She'd been on her own, and the trip was more about soul-searching than swimming, though swim she certainly had. Today, they weren't the only ones at Clyn Idwal. Although, for the hikers and the school groups, the lake itself seemed to be either a selfie opportunity or a scenic obstacle, something to be gone around. They didn't know what they were missing. Whoa, said Leah, as they cleared the brow of the hill. She took her phone out of her pocket and tried to fit the incredible view into one photograph. Left or right, V, said Richard. You could either turn left and walk clockwise around the lake, climbing quickly up the mountainside towards the Devil's Kitchen, a treacherous pass high up on the ridge, or turn right, where the path and the pebble beach hugged the shoreline for longer. Fee pointed right. That's where she swam last time. They heard the rescue helicopter before they saw it, coming in low up the valley behind them, then hovering over the centre of the lake. One of the Sikorsky S-92s that had replaced the old yellow Sea Kings. It was big. A 20-seater, if not for winch gear payload, Feig estimated. And distinctive in shape, with two large sponsons, fuel tanks resembling sawn-off wing stubs, projecting pannier-like, one each side, from the lower fuselage. The hole was rendered in the new red and white livery of the civilian search and rescue fleet. Fee had seen them in action a few years back. She'd taken a break from working the Force 4 stand at Farnborough to go and watch a demo. But Fee was curious to see the heli in real-world conditions. It wasn't just a casual interest. She'd been thinking about the handling of the EV toll amid the turbulence and wind tunnel effects of the concrete canyons around Nine Elms and Battersea Heliport. When she'd worked at Force 4, she'd spent a lot of time modelling rotor behaviour in crosswinds. That work had directly contributed to helicopter clearance for the new Merlins to operate off the backs of ships. One of the most difficult things you can do with a helicopter was landing on a ship especially if it was cracking along. She'd taken immense pride in the work. Every hurricane season, the Navy were out in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, ferrying in relief and rescuing flood or earthquake victims. And for a few years, the technical achievement and the humanitarian work had outweighed her anxieties. But eventually, she'd found she couldn't ignore them. Something had to give. It was Richard who saw them first. It is a rescue. Look! It was hard to adjust to the huge scale of the place, but he'd spotted two tiny figures in high vis up by the Idwal slabs. The heli dipped its nose and hung there for a second or two before ascending sideways to a position nearer the climbers. Lucky, said Leah as they watched the rescuer and litter, a kind of enclosed stretcher, descending on the winch. That they weren't on their own or whatever. Hope they're okay. Once the rescuer reached the ground and disconnected, the helicopter moved back to a safer distance from the rock face. The crew would have trained for all eventualities and would know these hills like the back of their hands. But having some insight into the sheer complexity and engineering challenges of the operation and seeing how the heli was responding to the forces of the moment acting upon it, Fee's heart was in her mouth. The winch was simple but effective kit. Its very simplicity brought safety. But it was operating within a dynamic and continually unfolding field of multiple dependencies within risk contours that could quickly cascade towards catastrophic failure. 
Watching from the shore, they all felt huge relief when the rescuer waved the heli back and hooked the litter, now containing the patient, to the winch. Even when the last echoes of engine noise were lost in the hills, they were still stood there in silence, watching the two remaining climbers make their way back down the distant slope. Fee felt like the last time she was here, it had been her that needed rescuing. Peter looked around and took off his backpack. Come on, let's get the tents up. I want to swim. Suzanne and Fee were swimming tomorrow, buddy in today. So, while the others were getting ready and putting up the tents they used for base camp, somewhere to get warm and to keep clothes and kit dry, Fee thought she might as well pick up where they had left off. Where have we got to? said Fee. Go on, ask me that question again. What, about Force 4? said Suzanne. Okay. Why did you leave your last job? Good question, thought Fee. Dad shut the door behind him. That looks good. What are you building? He was standing in the doorway, holding placemats, knives and forks, ketchup. Fee's Lego was spread out over the dining table. Homework done her school bag still open where she'd left it on the dark blue leather sofa. What do you think it is? said Fee. But then she realised it probably didn't look like what it was supposed to be, so she told him. It's a space shuttle petrol station. She'd cannibalised various bits of Star Wars Lego and some other stuff and somehow integrated Meccano, to create a sort of superstructure that it all loosely clicked around and into. In orbit? Yeah. What are those Meccano pieces, Fee? Solar panels? She nodded. Is it crude? Yeah, she said, pointing at four little Lego figures. Her die-cast corgi space shuttle slotted into a kind of holding pen, where a small piece of Lego kept it in place, even when she held it upside down. I like it, he said. You're a clever girl. If you work hard, you can do anything you want. Remember that. She had remembered it, and said it herself many times. But actually, wasn't it more the point that you couldn't always do what you wanted? Or that not everyone could? Anyway, was that why five years earlier she'd been reluctant at first to move on? To admit that she was in the wrong job for her? Why she'd come up here to Thlinidwal on her own to think things through? Fee certainly hadn't come from a privileged background. Having gone to secondary school in what she now realised was quite a deprived area... She knew plenty of people from school who had jobs, but they didn't necessarily have careers. And even if you'd had potential, for most of them, there'd been no clear route to reaching it. No examples to follow. There'd been loads of arguments when it came to choosing GCSEs. Her mum had wanted Fee to do history and geography, but she'd wanted to do IT, art and graphic products instead. It had taken her Auntie Jane stepping in to support her. There's no point, Jane had said to her mother, trying to force Fiona to do what you want her to do. Her mum had said, but Art GCSE won't get her a job. And you think geography will, Fee had said. That doesn't even make sense. You're going to have to try harder than that, Mum. You're not going to win this argument if it doesn't make sense. She'd been right. And ultimately, all the university places she'd applied for were for different flavours of engineering. Then, after completing her PhD, she'd been thrilled with the job offer at Force 4. She'd felt lucky. A woman from her background doing this. But as time went on, she'd felt more conflicted about working for a military contractor. So? 
said Suzanne. Well, it just became a massive conflict of interest, said Fee. And this really is not a criticism of the armed forces, but sometimes they're commanded by government to do things that are completely immoral. I had to ask myself, do I want to be involved in enabling that? I mean, there were lots of really good things. You know, the humanitarian work, the Royal Navy sending wildcat helis out to the Caribbean in hurricane season. I contributed to that. To know I'd done something in a small way to make that happen is amazing. Tell that to the little girl playing with Lego. You could be doing this. But on the flip side, these are military capabilities you're providing. Weapon release systems from helicopters that might kill innocent people. And when you're working alongside a lot of pro-military folk, you're in a little bubble. There's not a lot of opportunity for full and frank debate. No, I can imagine, said Suzanne. Is that why you dyed your hair? Ha, <laughs> no, said Fee. But it was why I had to come up here five years ago and think things through. I recognised that I needed to get out. Luckily, an opportunity in the civil market came along and I grabbed it with both hands. Fee felt lighter for having shared that suddenly more exhilarated by the walk and this extraordinary landscape. It was exactly five years ago, she said, give or take. So between you and me, this trip is a sort of anniversary. Oh, congratulations, said Suzanne. That's worth a pint later. I mean, we can't all afford to be holier than thou. But sometimes you have to say, I'm not okay with that anymore. Otherwise, I'm just some girl in Bristol with blue hair who's got opinions. Suzanne walked to the shore where the others were now getting in. She was pointing back at Fee and laughing. Hey, did you know our Fee had swum the channel? Fee thought again about that lonely walk up here five years earlier the short but restorative swim and the decision that had been made by the time she got out of the water to leave Force 4. That was also the moment that the meaning of her tattoo had literally changed. Not the words themselves. It still said, nothing great is easy. And when she was swimming the channel, those words of Captain Matthew Webb's had really helped. That's why she'd got the tattoo. She thought it was about perseverance, gritting your teeth and getting through it. But maybe that was just what she needed to hear at the time. It had kept her going in the English Channel, and at Force 4 too, for a few years. But after that swim in Llyn in Dwal, in the snow, dressed in re-warming in her bivvy, with a flask of chocolate and some cake, it had suddenly clicked. And she'd realised that that wasn't really what it meant at all. It wasn't about blindly soldiering on regardless. It was about doing the right thing. That was the Hot Wells Cold Water Swimming Club by Tony White. So what did you think of it, Sophie? Uh, that was amazing. <laughs> it was uh, nothing like what I was expecting. Uh, but yeah, that was brilliant. And uh, Tony definitely um, definitely captured the, the key bits of the cold water swimming, uh, the cake. <laughs> and, and also, yeah, like I think he really captured kind of my thought processes and uh quite a lot of my character in in fee and unfortunately i don't have blue hair anymore 
but I am still just a girl in Bristol with a lot of opinions. <laughs> oh, that's, really, that's really nice to hear and, and interesting because one of the one of the curious things about doing this mixture of fact and fiction is we send the writer away and obviously the character they produce only knows a little bit about you. So it's interesting that he's managed to capture some of you know because obviously he had extra conversations but he's managed to capture you quite well yeah definitely, definitely. one of the things I found were quite interesting about it was you know when when you were watching those rescuers or your character god I fell into the trap there didn't I when your character <laughs> was watching one of those rescuers uh, that sort of kind of knowing ev- what everything's going on with the engineering and, and I certainly feel that's really true isn't it you have a depth of knowledge about and you bring something to those situations beyond the oh it's a helicopter and they're doing a rescue yeah, definitely. And so this is one of the really interesting things that we um, that Tony and I talked about, actually. And he got in touch with me and kind of said, oh, can you can you read this? And it was a couple of sentences. And he was talking about the um, uh, the winch on the aircraft. And actually, he was kind of he was describing the winch as being a really complex, high tech piece of equipment. And I was like, mm, Tony, I don't actually think that's correct. I think if you think about all the rest of the helicopter, the winch is probably the simplest bit on there. And that's the thing about it that's, you know, that's, that's good. The fact that it is literally just a wire with a hook on the end and a motor. Uh, the fact that it is simple enables it to do the job that it does and allows it to do it safely. So yeah, it was, it was interesting to kind of share my perspective as somebody who kind of knows a little bit more about what's going on in those situations with him. Um, yeah, so it was a really interesting chat that we had. And did you chat a lot about this sort of ethical dilemma? Because obviously, underpinning, you've got the you've got the cold water swimming, you've got the engineering side, but you've also got this dilemma about how what your engineering gets used for. Yeah, we did, and you know, um, it's it's no, it's in no way. Well, actually, I think Tony captured this quite well. It, it's no way a criticism of people that serve in the armed forces or the you know the the people that are on the ground that choose to do these jobs um but it it is something that I've thought a lot about and you you know you have to think about how your actions and what you choose to do with your life how that has consequences for people beyond you um and it's you know in this in a similar way um to the way that we were talking about maybe actually not everybody has the opportunity to do what they want to do in life you know you can be funneled into um jobs which maybe don't align with your personal beliefs or your kind of um moral compass I guess is a good way to describe it you can have to you know do jobs that don't necessarily agree with you because we live in a capitalist society and you know I have to pay rent and buy toilet roll and things like that so you need a job that pays uh and I've been very lucky that I've got a skill set where I can say actually no I maybe I don't want to do this anymore I can go and do something else Um, and I think that's one of the one of the good things about engineering is that there are lots of opportunities where you can use your skill set to make a difference and make a difference in lots of different fields as well that's really interesting because uh, the bit of the interview we're going to go back to in a moment uh, is a, when we discuss, you know, the environmental credentials of electronic aircraft. So, mm. in a, in a sense, the military side and the and the ethical dilemmas are writ large and they're obvious, aren't they? But m- maybe this idea that should you make a technology if you can is something a bit more subtle, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And um, we really have to think about, you know particularly in with EV tolls, the sourcing of the materials for the batteries and um, the environmental impact at the end of life. You know, what, what do you do with all of these uh, batteries which are full of very nasty chemicals which um, need to be recycled and processed so that they're safe? Yeah, and I'd like to sort of kind of do a shout out also to our listeners to say, you know, if you've got thoughts on this, we'd love to hear from you on our socials or you can go to our website, www.inventivepodcast.com and let us know what you think. We'd really be interested because I think I don't think there's a straight answer to this. This is right and this is the wrong thing to do. So please just get in touch. Um, was there anything else you took from it, Sophie? I think I might go and build a space shuttle petrol station. So. <laughs> Not quite sure why my space shuttle needed a petrol station if it had solar panels, though. 
<laughs> but yeah, no, let's leave it that. Well, I mean, thank you very much for being a sport and, and allowing us to Welcome. create that story and doing the interview. We'll go back to that now. So uh, uh, thank you very much, Sophie. No worries. Can't wait to hear the rest of it as well. See if I can remember what I said last time. <laughs> I guess if I think about climate change, so you're using electrical vehicles here. So uh, as long as we can make clean electricity, then this is this is potentially carbon neutral, uh, except for possibly the manufacture of it. It, it. At least it's better than conventional aircraft. But I guess another way of tackling climate change would be to go, let's not fill up the skies with these taxis. Let's just travel less. So do you think as engineers, we need to be thinking about, you know, do we need to make the next invention or do we actually have to think about changing society so we don't need to make the invention, if that makes sense? That's a very good question. So I think, so from a personal point of view, I think it has to be a mixture of the two, doesn't it? Because the world is a big and interesting place. And I, I'm a big traveller myself, like I'm on a plane off somewhere as soon as I can get the opportunity, you know, every single time. And on a purely selfish level, I don't want to stop doing that. So if we can reduce emissions in other areas, like unnecessary areas, that can only be a good thing. And hopefully this kind of vehicle can contribute towards that. And I know if you look at the air quality in Bristol, it causes deaths because the air quality is so poor. And that is due to the emissions from fossil fuel powered vehicles. So Anything that can reduce that type of emissions is going to increase people's quality of life. And I think I think it's all about balance. Uh, there's no one thing that's going to solve this, but anything that we can do to move towards reducing carbon emissions, increasing air quality has to be a good thing. I, I guess uh, someone could accuse me of making a rather Luddite kind of argument here and that uh, humans make progress and... Uh... We can't stop inventing things and we shouldn't stop inventing things. Absolutely. Why Why did I become an engineer in the first place? And it was because I wanted to be involved in projects that are like this. It's, uh, you know, completely innovative. It's That's human nature, isn't it? We always want to find what is the next step? What's the next new thing? How can we put together the different technologies that we develop? Because EV tolls really, it's an area where a lot of technology from different areas is starting to come together in previously unused ways. So in aviation, the advances that we've had in battery technology, things like the cloud services and information technology being integrated into these vehicles, the advances that we've had in materials technologies. So a lot of our aircraft is made out of carbon fiber, which is very stiff and very strong, but also very light. So they're really going to be a step change from the things that are already out there. Um, I I agree with you like we can't stop innovation it's something that humans naturally want to do so there's a lot of often in engineering you have a problem that you need to solve and there are lots of different ways that you can get to the solution to that problem and it's up to you as an engineer to kind of work out how you're going to do that and as you go along you discover different hurdles and you often have to use your creativity and your problem solving ability because the old methods don't always work and that's a particular thing that we're finding with this aircraft is that you know there's a certain ways that you would do things for traditional fixed wing aircraft or for a traditional helicopter but because this is neither it needs something new. Yeah, I, I mean, do you feel like you're uh, like a modern day Wright Brothers then, breaking new ground and producing I, new flight capabilities? I, I would have to maintain some humility and I don't think I could possibly compare myself to the Wright Brothers. That's <laughs> but no, we're certainly pushing into unknown areas um, in the same way that they did. So they would build one and then they would build the next one and it would use the things that they'd learned on the previous one to improve it and make it better that's the same process that we're going through in our company so we started off with a very small 
drone which had no payload capability then we changed the design to something that was a bit more complicated and it was able to lift a bit more and now we're moving on to the next step which is even more complicated able to lift even more so those it's it's similar in some ways but for the sake of remaining humble i'm not going to directly compare myself to the right brothers <laughs> possibly a wise decision there <laughs> yeah <laughs> if, if you could change anything about engineering what what would it be mm, what would it be I'd probably make engineering more diverse. We need people from all walks of life because ultimately engineers design and build the world that all of us live in. So if that world is designed and built by men, it's probably not going to work for women. We need to make sure that the voices of everybody is heard in the world that we're building so that we create a world that can be lived in by everybody. You know, things like the majority of participants in drug trials tend to be men. These things can have really, really serious consequences for women. So we really need to make sure that in all areas of life, really, not just in engineering, that we have a diverse kind of representation of people to make sure that the world is equitable for everybody. Yeah, you see this uh, also in my my area in acoustics, for example. You see problems with speech recognition systems when they first came out work better for men because, of course, mostly they were designed for men and, and, and less well for women's voices. There's also an, a classic kind of aviation story that the stall warning enunciation in the cockpits of big passenger jets is traditionally a woman because pilots are traditionally men and they will tend to listen more to a woman's voice and do what it says than they would to a man's voice, which I always think is quite funny. Yeah, y- years ago, I was asked by a garage what sound to play at people. Because they, they, they see people pull up to get petrol, and they know someone they're going to do a runner without paying. And I actually said the best thing would be if you could find out what, how the mother sounds and just <laughs> get someone to say in the mother's voice, I don't think you should do that, would be the most effective voice yeah. you could use. Um I mean, what's it, what's it, I mean, as you say, I mean, in, in engineering, it's 10, 15 percent women, depending on, you know, in, in general. I mean, what, what's it like then being in a minority in engineering? I think actually engineering in terms of being a career where women are welcome is one of the good ones, because actually in engineering, what matters is getting the job done. And if you can contribute to the team then that's actually mostly what people are interested in and that's how you you know you earn your kind of recognition having a gender neutral title because I've got a PhD so I'm a Dr Robinson a couple of times I have turned up places and people have gone oh we were expecting a man but that luckily doesn't happen too much anymore I think the times really are changing and there are a lot of women getting into very high profile positions with within engineering um so yeah times are changing if i could grant you a superpower sophie i mean if i had this amazing ability what would it be i think as an aerospace engineer i have to say the ability to fly don't i because then all of this stuff about carbon emissions would go away (laughs) and maybe the ability to grant everybody the ability to fly so that we didn't need planes anymore and we could save the planet. That would put you out of the job, though, uh, which would be yeah, the problem with yeah, that, I guess. Yeah, it probably would, wouldn't it? I, that's a bit of a, a Nigel Farage kind of answer, isn't it? I uh, <laughs> voted myself out of my own job. I've got other skills. I'm an engineer. I'm, I'm, I can do lots of things. So I'm sure I'd find something else. <laughs> I've always wanted to work in trains as well as space. So maybe I can go work in the trains instead. Thank you so much for giving us a great interview, Sophie. No problem. Bye, everybody. Inventive. Now, if I had to choose a superpower for you, would you go for flying? It seems to be an answer that is coming out from quite a few of our engineers. 
Well, let us know. You can get us on all the usual socials or go to www.inventivepodcast.com. We're always really interested to know what you take from these stories, both the fact and the fiction. Now, next episode, we'll feature an inspirational engineer, Asqua Halonga. Unfortunately, he suffered from waterborne diseases throughout his life due to drinking contaminated water when he was a youngster. And this has led him to create an amazing filtration system and also a network of water purification stations around Africa. Also next week is a short story by novelist Sarah Franklin. As Sarah runs the Short Stories Allowed events and is also a judge on the Costa Short Story Awards, I think we should expect something pretty special. So to make sure you don't miss that episode or any future episodes, please find us in all your usual podcast outlets. Now, Inventive is put together by a team, it's not just me. We have Anna Scott Brown and Adam Fowler, who were the producers. We have music from Brendan Williams. Animations were by Annabeth Robinson. And Jill Davis provided the social media and multi-platform support. I also need to particularly thank this week the actor Vita Fox, who recorded Tony White's story. As I record this remotely during lockdown, curriculum and career materials are being developed based on the interviews and the stories. They're being done by Carol Davenport, Antonia Portis and Jonathan Sanderson from NU STEM at Northumbria University. When they're published, you'll find them at NU STEM or you can go to our website www.inventedpodcast.com to find out more. The Inventive project was run by University of Salford. It was funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council and the podcast itself is an overtone production. So it's goodbye for me for now. Trevor Cox, Professor of Acoustic Engineering at the University of Salford. Mixing engineering fact and fiction.